Hi, everybody. Uh, hope everyone's doing well today. Um, my name is uh, Kimberly Lee, uh, but um, please call me Kim. Uh, my, when, my, when I'm in trouble, that's what my mother calls me. Uh, this is uh, Joe. He's my uh, coworker. We're both um, lead software engineers at um, Salesforce on the Central Performance uh, Foundation team. And uh, today we're going to be talking about how uh, basically we built an Argo workflows-based service. Um, from the ground up for primarily for the specific use case of performance testing and managed to get a lot of the um, current performance workloads all migrated over to us. So um, just to, um, since the inception of our service, we currently have um, around 550 users using our, uh, using our platform and uh, to total supporting over 200 teams right now at Salesforce. Um, since like the beginning when we were even just troubled like with the uh, prototyping with a few users up to now, um, over 190,000 uh, performance workloads have uh, ran on our service. Um, some of the workloads can spend up to 1,500 pods depending on um, how, what kind of uh, load testing they were doing. And uh, yeah, in the combined of like uh, 25 million performance artifacts right now and uh, over 70 terabytes of data is hosted in our service. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Xiao Zhou. Um, so today's for today's agenda, we're gonna focus on uh, our experience of building an Argo workflow-based service. So we're gonna divide into three discussion topics. So the first one is how we are able to design a seamless um, ex experience of the servers, which uh, still keep the flexibility. The second one is the strategy that we engage with our power users so that um, and also uh, to extend our service and also the commitment we have been uh, established with our users. The third one is the approach that uh, we sustain and maintain our service in the long-term perspective. Now, uh, let's get into the first um, this, uh, topic, so designing a cohesive experience. Um, so um, in order to build our service is um, the first thing we're gonna do is to understand our end users. So we approach this in a nice way, which means we just go to different teams, talk to them, try to understand um, their performance testing methodology. Um, that's actually both a good idea and bad idea, but overall um, we do see a couple uh, things, uh, learn a couple things after talking with them. The first thing is we realize that the variety of load testing tool that's been using. So some people use K6, um, other people use JMeter and even their own script. Um, and also they have been struggled to scale their performance tests on their local due to the hardware limitations. And then some of the team, they already built the uh, automation servers uh, to fit their performance data so that they're able to um, uh, into different tools such as the superset, Tableau, Splunk, etc. Um, they have been facing a lot of um, challenging and difficulty to be able to uh, locate their data and also uh, metrics, information, and also during the process of the debugging and uh, searching the data, etc. Um, the next thing is that uh, we also realized that the lack of the centralizations of a scheduling feature, which make it very challenging for people to test again a shared environment. So they used to use uh, Google Calendar. They have to uh, reserve the slot uh, if they want to use specific environments. Um, I think we also, um, so, um, so basically uh, from what we learned um, f after talking to these users, uh, we do see two uh, critical insights. So the first one is that um, they are not actually looking for a performance testing tool. In fact, they are looking for, they are actually asking for a um, workflow engine that's able to help them to uh, test their different uh, performance uh, workflows. The second things that we do notice is that um, even though um, different teams that are very, uh, they have a deep understanding of their use case, but most of this knowledge only in their own bubbles. So um, we actually change our strategy. So we decide to um, find the end users, um, uh, the power users actually. So we are looking for the users that has been working with multiple teams and also they might already build a lot of um, this kind of um, existing automation servers. Um, so they are actually not that difficult to locate if you 
um, take a look. Maybe they are they're going to look like this in the Zoom meetings. They are being frustrated. They have um, complained about the tedious work they have um, in their daily life for executing a perf test. And um, after on board with us, um, we actually realized that some of them, some of the workflow going to look like this. They have um, multi um, dependencies with a lot of um, uh, concurrent tasks need to be executed. So uh, with this great, um, such a big pile of feature requests ahead of us, so we actually categorize them into a two-part um, framework, the platform and the ecosystem. Um, so we also use this framework to uh, communicate with our end users. Considering that um, such a big variety of the tools that are being used, um, among different uh, engineers. Integrating all of them uh, into our service is actually not practical, but if we are able to um, locate, just pick a couple of them that's been common use, we actually uh, will be able to anchor most of the engineer already. Um, and honestly, we are not knowing better than they uh, for what they really want to use. So uh, we end up agreeing to have um, the load testing tools such as K6, JMeters, uh, into the ecosystem together with some um, post-processing tools. Oh, by the way, uh, regarding the platform and ecosystem, right? So um, for us, the, the platform means that um, the process, the core components and the servers that can be standardized will go into the platform. Anything that is that cannot be standardized will go into the ecosystem. And then um, come back to um, the platform, we also reach a consensus that uh, we do need to provide um, centralized data storage uh, so that all the performance data can be uh, consolidated and we build a um, standard for debugging for our users. Uh, meanwhile, um, uh, with all the post-processing um, tools that are sitting in the ecosystem, we realize the need to build, uh, to integrate the scheduling uh, request management servers and the searching tier uh, into our platform so that our end users will be able to um, locate their tests and also um, retrieve their uh, testing data. So overall, uh, the objective of our servers is trying to provide uh, the, the deliver the full spectrum of the performance tests um, starting from running, scheduling, debugging, and then um, the sub, um, uh, surface of the substantive phase for um, helping our user to um, execute their distinct performance workflow while keep the flexibilities. So now we uh, decide to um, go with the, with the scheduling um, requirement in mind. We set up our environment to be host, our, our servers to be host in a Kubernetes world. Um, and um, so the first thing to do is that uh, we're gonna uh, for all the workflow templates and the, for all the workflow templates and the Docker image, they should be available directly um, from the Argo workflow. Besides that, uh, we build an API in front of the Argo. Um, this um, is executed by the SSO, and this helps to transform the user request to Argo workflow. Um, and many of you might already notice that. Um, uh, actually, our service is deployed in a shared cluster um, so that um, we actually, uh, the Marco workflow is deployed in our um, own uh, namespace. And unfortunately, um, the controller, uh, the permission of our controller is on the namespace level. That means, and also um, our end user doesn't have their own namespace. So all the workflow that being created actually will uh, be on our namespace. So uh, having this service in front of Argo will help for the access control, just in case that you can foresee the accident can happen, like people accidentally delete um, the work, um, the workflow, etc. Uh, also, uh, we add the scheduler features into our API by leveraging the uh, Argo Chrome workflow. Then, uh, for every workflow that we create, uh, the port will spin up. Um, Assist log sidecar, which is responsible to push the metrics and data to spin, uh, Prometheus and Splunk. And also, uh, uh, as, the, as the end, we uh, have our artifact 
to be uh, uploaded to the um, object storage. With uh, the system being set up like this, our end users is able to uh, use their own tools or uh, the tool on their local or as part of the workflow to do whatever data analysis they would like to do um, on the logs, on the metrics, and all the artifacts. So um, our data workflow is pretty straightforward, uh, but we also do couple um, make a couple decisions to help our end users. Um, so considering we are dealing uh, we are dealing such a chaos system with all the data, metrics, configurations running around without the coordinations and schemas, your UID and in invert index uh, is our friends. So we decide to move everyone to UUID for their workflow. This will help our user to easily um, locate the performance test and artifact. Um, also, uh, we provide um, artifact servers, uh, uh, which include a, um, a search uh, tier um, on top of our data storage. Um, so the user is able to use the tag to categorize their performance uh, test. And then um, the tags and the artifacts will be indexed together, um, denoted by the UUID, so that the user is able to uh, easily locate their artifacts and also to confirm if uh, certain artifacts being created. Now, uh, let's hand over to uh, my colleague, Kim. So this is great. We have a platform, um, but basically what ended up happening was we pretty much had a city with functioning roads and a sewage system, but absolutely no housing. So the next part was um, we started to think about, all right, for a lot of these tools that we know a lot of our diverse um, performance in like the engineers, they're running all sorts of performance workloads. All they, are, all they had their own uh, diverse use cases. What were the tools that made the first uh, most sense to start, you know, maybe building an ecosystem from? And uh, the best people for us to talk to was actually our power users. So, uh, we this, so we decided to talk to our power users again and see how we could work with them on this. So how did we work with them? Um, to, be to be honest, we actually had to be incredibly careful about this because the truth was is that a lot of them have had some automation built, even though they were on Jenkins and on their, you know, uh, they were of course like, uh, uh, how would you say, like they were constrained within like the hard, like with hardware resources. Uh, we basically had to be very careful because it, it would have felt like we were directly competing with them when that was not true. Um, one thing they did really like about us even before they decided to migrate over a lot of their tools was um, the fact that we were on Kubernetes. And um, so th the first thing that we did was we talked to them about what were the most widely used tools that were used among uh, most of the performance engineers. Uh, what were the most business stopping tools too? And, um, and a lot of these tools were stuff like, um, for example, JMeter, K6. There was also some internal load testing tools that was very common um, that um, a lot of engineers were using, including, including for like post analysis, like DB, um, AWR, like being able to pull down AWR reports. And uh, these were all very, they were like, these are all the crucial ones that everyone needs to be using. Um, the other one we also decided on board were like the most painful to set up tools. Um, these were the ones with the extremely long readmes and also like just setting it up on the local machine was something that could have probably taken like six hours for um, an, like, a, like an engineer to do normally. So for the tools that they asked, they told us like, okay, but most of the engineers would use these despite how different everyone's use case was. We then agree, we made an agreement with our users, um, with our power users, like, all right, for these tools, we will centralize these and we will send, set up a power uh, workflow templates for these. So we were standardizing and helping them with promoting these tools. So the, for the tools we wanted to standardize, we did also have an additional issue, which was that um, for tools like JMeter, like, uh, like for the load testing, um, even though a lot, of, uh, a lot of our teams were using stuff like that, they were, there was like probably seven different versions floating around. Um, and depending on the, like just how the org system worked for within Salesforce, some of those teams will then be like, okay, my stuff is only checked into here, whereas for some other people, they check in their scripts to another source. 
um, this was not going to really work really well for us. Um, so we decided, like, uh, maybe we should probably take advantage of our team name and probably set up a Git repo organization specifically to start making um, some of, a lot of these tools official. And this was also going to help promote like a more collaborative environment, also help with discoverability, uh, because um, a lot of the engineers were working on their own silo. Um, some of them were actually building, funny enough, a lot of internal tools like data loading tools, ETL tools, um, without realizing other teams were building more or less the same thing, and they, were, they both should, could have just worked with each other on this. So, we worked with, um, so these were the ones that we first like onboarded. We onboarded like, uh, of course, like JMeter K6. So the ones that most users would use, we, we basically said like, we will take care of these in like onboarding them and as well as uh, any um, analysis tools and uh, data loading tools. Um, but this is a shared hub and we did recognize that a lot of the users um, would probably have some objections about like, oh, why are you not supporting my tool? So we made it easy for them to also just onboard straight to our Git repo. Um, like uh, Joe was mentioning earlier, our users had a lot of, a lot of the engineers did not really have access to the k clusters without going through a series of security, um, like security processes to get that um, valid, you know, verified for them and everything. So, and all, furthermore, they, even though they did sometimes have Docker images created already for their repos, it, it, it didn't mean they could check it into the, um, image registry that our Argo workflows was able to download from. So to make it easy for them where they only have to wait maybe a few minutes, uh, we also automatically um, included like a Git hook in here, which would detect if they have a Docker file or a YAML file of some kind. Um, so if it's like a Helm charts, we will go ahead and deploy those, create those resources for them. Um, but if they are uh, like Docker files, we will also bundle those up and push those to an image registry that we were, are then able to get. So we, you know, we, this was uh, pretty successful, but then what ended up happening is um, support got pretty out of control pretty quickly uh, because um, we, we got a lot of users, which meant there was also a lot of workflows to support. The other thing too with performance testing we noticed was that a lot of them were actually testing against shared environments too. And they, you can probably imagine how much chaos that, that would cause. So for us to try to understand more of what was going on at that time, because we have some, there was too many use cases, we had to know what's going on. We decided to taxonomize our workflows and uh, decided to coin it uh, uh, Pancake, Tower, uh, Pancake Tower of Pain. Um, hermetic is probably a term I'm sure, especially folks in DevOps probably heard a lot. Um, people who have used Bazel also have, um, you know, hear it everywhere. Uh, we decided to use this term just to kind of, um, just to categorize, like these are the workflows that are self-contained. They don't need any external communication other than parameters coming in and artifacts coming out. Uh, these workflows were the least troublesome for us to deal with. Um, sadly though, a lot of us, a lot of them were not like this. So the next level we could hope for for a workflow whenever we're debugging them was please let it be a stateless workflow. Um, these are, uh, even if they're hitting like in a shared environment, hopefully they're only doing like, you know, read only like immutable data from the outside world. But our unfortunate reality was most of our workflows from the performance in, uh, from the, you know, performance testing were all stateful workflows. Um, so even though there was really nothing, there wasn't any issues specifically with like running the workflow itself, there was a lot of issues that came in around the shared environments coming, um, going down and up. And we got in trouble with lots of different teams about that. So, but, and then, but then we decided like, okay, well for hermetic workflows, we need to focus on the developer experience here. As long as they're able to create um, with our API or UI, select a couple parameters, be able to run the type of performance uh, workflow that they want um, without needing our help at all, then we succeeded here. Uh, for stateless, the focus was more on debugging here, the debugging experience, um, because we wanted to make sure like, with the, we want to make sure that if anything goes wrong, even with the state, like those, uh, when they're reading something from somewhere or running 2,400 um, users and trying to send like millions of requests, 
per, uh, per, per minute or something, they are able to debug easily like what happened with their workflow and anything went wrong. The stateful workflows were a lot tougher. This was the one where we really had to focus more on finding, um, like be able to figure out why what happened and also who can help fix the problems very quickly because generally for these stateful workflows, they are hitting so many different services within, um, they're hitting so many different environments, but not just environments itself. They could be testing against so many different products at a time that this was a major issue. So the one thing we decided to do is uh, we wanted to see how we can minimize the blast radius. For example, how could we turn like a more stateful workflow, uh, one that modifies the outside world could potentially cause chaos to something more stateless. Um, some things we had to do was uh, like uh, we, our team was working with, uh, for example, the infrastructure team to, uh, that were building, you know, building a lot of the different test environments on the public cloud. Is there a way that, you know, like, uh, like how can we help you guys scale to like, uh, you know, configuring like their HPA, all these sort of things so that in case they do get bombarded, the whole environment doesn't go down um, and then affect everybody else. Um, and then some of the worst cases we had was also like if the test failed in the middle of like configuring um, a shared environment, because um, we did have some that would be like, okay, I'm gonna change these configurations on this app level. And then sometimes what ends up happening is um, they try to change something else at the hardware level and then the whole environment um, goes down or the environment gets put in a very bad state. Um, but then they don't realize that until the next person runs. And then when the next person runs, um, a workflow. They're just like, I can't, uh, this is not going to work anymore because they, that's when they encounter the issues. So, um, so these were some of the things we were trying to see like, okay, could we, how, what can we do to change it to a stateless, more stateless one? Um, one of the, this is not like the best solution, um, but it was kind of the more foolproof one that we did. One of the things we did was we definitely utilize Argo Workflows exit handlers here in this case to ensure that when never a workflow is completed, we get we are able to hit like one of their CI CD pipelines that own that shared environment to be able to build the environment back to its original state. Then the next user that scheduled their workflow to run on the same test environment, it's exactly what they're expecting. We also do, did advice like, hey, for stateless, for your workflows, please also have health checks in place so that you fail early. Now the stateless workflows really didn't cause as much issues, but we did, like think about like, okay, but can we make these like somehow more self-contained? Because the shared, testing against a shared environment is a, it can be a very volatile, um, it can be extremely volatile and very unpredictable. So one of the solutions we were, while we were working with our users was like, um, is it possible for them to instead spin up like a temper, like an ephemeral lab actually? Um, like, is this a lab that, you know, you can do all of the experiments you want and every, anything to make the workflow as self-contained as possible and not have to affect any, anything in the outside world that is not within their workflow. Um, and actually this was pretty successful because the folks who decided to later switch to ephemeral lab, um, there is a downside to this. They did have to wait for the lab to come up and then they also had to wait for um, like for example, the warm up for the cold cache, uh, warm up the DB and everything, and that so that also took time. That did include additional steps in their workflow, but they were able to at the very least um, start paralyzing their workflow, which in the end did save them time because they didn't have to run them one at a time anymore with the shared environment and be worried about noisy neighbors. And then uh, actually by with that solution too, we were also were evaluating stateful workflows in this case of like, if you are, if it's gonna be this chaotic where so many changes are happening and it's very hard to recover from, or it's gonna be like another five hour delay to recover, how can we turn those into, can you use an ephemeral lab instead? So the main goal of us was like, you know, of, of our service was like, for the performance testing is we wanted flexibility, but flexibility really wasn't the end goal. We wanted to see how we can turn that something flexible into something very usable. Uh, but how can we create like a platform, but also an ecosystem that really, you know, fosters like a community growth for our platform. So we work with our power users to capture the standards. And of course the power users helped us in like capturing all the use cases with the end customers. 
And then the last takeaway really is just um, even if you have all of your support in place, uh, take a look also at the workflows and see how you can make them either hermetic or stateless and work with your users to have a good system to mitigate these uh, complexities. Right. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, any questions or? Okay. Hello. I have many questions, but I'll just ask one at the moment. Sure. And maybe catch you later if that's possible. Yeah, of course. Um, you said that you offered a service where you would build the Docker file and the Helm charts for them, which is yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, but even for internal users, how did you make sure that it was done safely? Uh, so we, so basically as part of the Git hook, there were like, um, this is stuff we can definitely improve on, but definitely, but while, but before like, basically once the PR is created, the SNCC scans will kick in. There's a build process that also kicks in just to make sure that the Docker file can be created because it would be bad if we find out you know, after they merge, the, the whole build is um, bad. And of course, we also had um, the power users, luckily, we basically, every tool that they had in that um, Git org that they owned, we had them um, also be an owner in there. And of course, we were there to um, also ensure everything is gonna go as it, as it should. But those were some of the stuff that we have done. There's some things we could do uh, better. For example, there are sometimes um, especially after like an upgrade or like when the vulnerabilities um, s that gets found out later. Sometimes it doesn't get all caught immediately. So those are some things we can improve on right now. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, you guys, uh, we'll be around if you guys need us. Thank you.